keeping you in a ration. You're going to enjoy it. <clears throat> okay. Hello. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Okay. Praise be the God and Father of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Praise the Father's beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. Praise the Holy Spirit of the living God, the eternal Spirit of the Father and the Son. May the Spirit sanctify us and wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, amen. <clears throat> I'll, be, I'll pray more intensely in a minute. Just give you guys a few more moments to get ready, to prepare yourselves emotionally, mentally, spiritually by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll wait for a few more faces. As you can see, I'll be on at different times. Right now the house is empty, so pray in Jesus' name that it will be empty for at least two hours. And pray by December I get my own place and pray in Jesus' name for a verdict that will be a blessing next Wednesday. Please, I need miraculous intervention. Next Wednesday, November 20th, so I can stay here, settle here for the foreseeable future and trust Jesus Christ, my Lord, my love to bring my daughters. I ache for them, guys. I really do, and I miss them. Ask Jesus to bless them and to comfort them and fill them with his love and to remind them that their Baba loves them and that we'll be together sooner than later. It's not easy. It really isn't, you know? But yes, so good to see you guys, all the familiar faces. We have first last year, Revelation 22, Choose, Riaz, Jason, Zena, Princess Warrior, Warrior, who drove her brother to suicide and made him question whether there is a creator. But praise God, he now knows there's a creator, and that creator is the triumph God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and he's repented of his atheism in Jesus' name. Jeremy, welcome, everyone, welcome. Right. Yeah, choose Jesus if you only knew in the how hard it is for me. Some days are harder than others. Today was very hard. No notification on YouTube. What well, is Christian Prince on? See, this is the thing. I don't like to be on when other brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ are on. Pray for the internet connection because it's going to get go in and out. Poor guy, man. I hope he didn't think I did it deliberately. Oh, man. Okay. Oh, well. Yeah, I hope he doesn't think I did it deliberately. Let him know the reason why I'm on now is because of my situation. If I had my own place, internet connection, then I could come on at a regular time and not coincide with his time. Right? I don't like to do that. When David Wood is on, well, even when he's on, no one comes to me. Everyone goes to him. What's up, Cabello? When the moon hits your eye. Anyway, pray the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, beatify me with the beauty of Jesus Christ and keep us holy. Let me ask the Lord to bless this session. <clears throat> Today was a very rough day, so ask the Lord to bless us. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, we enter your presence by the grace and mercy of your Son, the Lord Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ to be our covering, to purify us, so that we can enter your presence filled with the Holy Spirit, the throne of grace boldly. Father, bless this session for the glory of Jesus Christ. Bless the internet connection. Anoint me by your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit to speak truth clearly without error, without stammering, without confusion, and enable me by your Spirit to recall Scripture perfectly. And exegete your word perfectly, Father, for your glory, for the glory of Jesus, for the glory of your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> you are the only true God in union with your Son, your word, your beloved, and your eternal spirit. Bless everyone here, Father. <clears throat> Bless them with wisdom and knowledge and understanding from your spirit. And give us the power, the strength, and energize us by your Holy Spirit to crucify our flesh, to die to our flesh, to despise our flesh, to despise the temptations of the evil one and the world, and to resist them in the power of your spirit, filled with life from your spirit, fruit from your spirit, love from your spirit, patience from your spirit. Give us self-control and self-constraint and self-restraint by your spirit and patience, Father. 
And Father, fill my lungs, my chest, my throat with the breath of life, the health I need to do this for your glory. And Father, again, I say, bless everyone who's present. Bless who, those who will listen. Bless our family, our loved ones. In my case, my two angels whom I love and adore. In Jesus' name, bless them. Bless us all. Cover us and wash us and purify us in the blood of Jesus. Seal us by your spirit. Surround us with a wall of fire from your Holy Spirit, Father. And again, I ask that you bless this session for the glory of Jesus and the internet connection. We love you, Ab. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name, Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God bless you, Vine. I know I'm sorry I'm a little late because, again, I don't have my own place, but I'm trusting the Lord will provide a place at least by December because my brother is coming to live with me to get situated, settle here. And I'm trusting for miraculous favor November 20th because that wicked judge, her heart is in the hand of Jesus. May he deal with her so I can stay here and provide through me for my children so that I have a set time every day. And I won't have to be on and off. Some days I'm on earlier. Some days I'm on later. And Lord willing, I'll try to do justice to this topic. Oh, yeah. Revelation 20 to that monotheist, uh, monotheist Satanist, that wicked. Again, guys, let me just begin by making a confession. <clears throat> As you can tell, I really do not like, and I, in fact, sometimes I despise and hate these anti-Trinitarians who, who are children of Satan, wolves in sheep's clothing, pretending to be humble servants when they're really demonized, filled of Satan, and hate the true God, but try to come off as being nice and pleasant in order to disarm us to accept them. And may it never be we accept such filthy dogs of Satan until they repent so this monotheist Satanist, notice even his title is insulting, degrading, and blasphemous. You understand what his title implies, right? Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. I pray more people think I'm handsome. Right? Okay, you understand his title is insulting, Revelation 22, 13, where he, where he puts monotheist Christian, and then in parentheses, non-Trinitarian. In other words... We Trinitarians are not monotheists. You understand the insult, the blasphemy, because he's a wicked, filthy dog of Satan? Now, he can repent and turn to the true God, and he'll be our brother in Christ or sister. I don't know what it is, right? Thank you, Dan Betzel. Keep praying. Some gentleman, or I, I don't know if it's even a gentleman, if it's a sister, King of Kings, his name on YouTube is Monotheist. Christian, and then in parentheses, non-Trinitarian. See, this is why you guys need to be zealot, zealous and passionate for the true God, passionate for his glory. Not that he needs us, but we need to show the world that we love our God to the point we'll even die for our God, right? We're not like Muslims. We're not violent, but we're willing to die for our God, right? You understand he's insulting you guys, right? When he puts monotheist Christian, in parentheses, non-Trinitarian, he's saying that, you can't be a monotheist if you're a Trinitarian, right? You understand the insult there? You see why I treat him like a filthy dog until he repents? Yes. So don't be nice to these folks. Expose them, shame them, demolish their arguments for the glory of Christ. I'm being honest, right? You understand? He's being insulting. He's a monotheist or not, right? Right? Now, today was a very rough day. I want to just make a confession. This is why I'm going to work harder by the strength and the power that the Holy Spirit gives us. I am really trusting that by your prayers, my prayers, the Holy Spirit will give me such power and strength, all of us, but especially me because I need it, to die to my flesh, to despise my flesh and crucify my flesh and control it, not to be controlled by it. Today, unfortunately, I really lost my testimony in a fit of rage and anger towards a Christian brother where it got to the point I even started cussing him. But thank the Lord Jesus for his graciousness and constraint that as I got out of hand, I realized it. And then right away, I said, I can't be doing this. And I apologized and I begged for his forgiveness. And he showed himself to be more Christ-like than me and forgave me for the sake of Jesus. I felt very bad, disappointed, disgusted with myself. 
So brethren, pray hard for me. I don't disqualify myself. I don't shame Jesus Christ. I don't fall from grace. Because the last thing I want to do is shame Jesus and cause people to stumble. I don't want that. And it was a lesson and reminder that I really have to exercise the strength and power that the Spirit has given me. That I don't do this again. And I pray I don't do this again. That I can control this anger. And if there's any demons that are pricking my flesh, may the blood of Jesus cover me and the fire of the Holy Spirit drive them away. Right? It's... It really disappointed, disgusted, and disheartened me. But thank God he was gracious enough to forgive. He was being more Christ-like than me. Thank the Lord for the grace in his heart. And I pray I don't do it again. But I will tell you that as I asked for prayer on social media, remember I said, and I'm going to say this again, and this is advice for every one of you. Do not assume that every Christian or so-called Christian has your best interest in, uh, at heart. There are people who are Christian who are weak themselves and carnal themselves or false Christians who are waiting for you to fall so that they can attack you, belittle you, stick the knife in deeper and just kick you while you're down. And two people did that to me. I think they're both sisters. One of them who hasn't even reached out to contact me about my situation or about my children just ignores me, decided to send me a private message reminding me of Job's miserable, unwise friends who gave him miserable counsel, saying to me, look what she said to me, and she's being Christ-like and she's being humble. Yeah, you know, you, you, you react emotionally and you may not be mentally stable and you never uh, listen and are you going to do something about it? And I told the person, I go, I'm not angry when I say this. Remove yourself from my pages. Don't ever come back here again because you're a wicked, arrogant, conceited, carnal, so-called Christian, pretending to be a Christian, giving me godly advice. Your arrogance is repulsive. Remember what I said? That's not how you counsel. And I'm not trying to boast or use myself as an example. Do you remember our brother who was struggling in sin? Did you see how we went about trying to restore him gently when he confessed his sin and his weakness, all of us reached out to him in a spirit of love, fulfilling Galatians 6 verses 1 or 2. That's what you do when a brother or a sister is honestly acknowledging their weakness, their failure, and their sin. You don't kick them while they're down, beat them and make them feel worse. That's counsel of the devil. Right? So, saying, I may not be mentally stable. I don't listen. And what am I going to do about it? And this person thinks that they're spiritual and they're walking in the spirit. Unbelievable. Anyway, with that said, let's begin. And by the way, oh, yes, I wanted to address this. Someone mentioned in my comment section so we can begin. We'll focus now on the topic by the grace of God's spirit. Vine, the world is a nasty place. You'll find nasty people in churches. You'll find nasty people in monasteries. You'll find nasty people all around you, Vine. And I'm sure being an ex-monk, you can testify, Vine, that even in the monastery, you met some nasty people. Maybe I'm wrong, but this is the thing. I want to remind you again. The church is a spiritual hospital. It is a spiritual hospital. What do you expect to find in a hospital? Sick people. Some more sick than others. And so if the church is a spiritual hospital, don't be shocked. You're going to find arrogant, wicked, conceited snots, gossipers, slanderers, people who struggle with sexual morality, Liars and cheaters, because all of these are forms of spiritual sicknesses and diseases that Jesus is welcoming into his hospital, the church, to heal them. Right? So, and as we want the Lord to be patient with us, we need to be patient with them. Easier said than done. And folks, I'll, I'll be honest. I do not like the fact that I get angry 
And sometimes I can't control my anger and I lash out. I don't like it. I despise it. I hate it because not only does it not edify others and hurts others, it doesn't edify me. Believe me, I don't want that. But again, I'm not trying to make an excuse for it. I'm a work in progress as we all are. And I really pray the Holy Spirit will give me the means by which to really control it for the glory of Christ. Yep, first and last, you understand. So you must be, <laughs> you must struggle with it as well. <laughs> now, let me explain a gross misunderstanding among some because someone commented, and I hope they're here, but if not, they'll leave, listen to the live stream. You now have a movement saying that those who preach repentance in order to be saved are preaching a false gospel. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is that you believe in Christ alone. For those people who say that, okay, now listen to me carefully. I believe that they're fundamentally misunderstanding what it means, what it means for Christians to say you must repent and believe in order to be saved. Because I've heard even Stephen Anderson say it's a false gospel, but the way he explained it wasn't <clears throat> the way. It's explained or understood by those who say you must repent and believe to be saved. Number one, let me explain what repentance unto life does not mean, meaning repenting, turning from your sin to Christ to be saved does not mean. They are not saying, they are not saying, God bless you running for the crown. They are not saying that you must Turn away from every sin you struggle with and stop sinning and turn to Christ and then you'll be saved. That's not the meaning when they say repent and believe in Christ to be saved. Okay. Let me explain what it means when you hear someone like John MacArthur, James White, John Piper, even, and I'm going to give you New Testament passages, say repent and believe to be saved. What they mean is, because in the Greek, and again, I'm not trying to get fancy here, metanoia, mispronouncing it. If you look at the lexicon, it'll tell you that one of the meanings is having a change of heart and a change of mind, a change of attitude towards your lifestyle and your sin. So it's not saying you must stop sinning and turn away from every sin and stop sinning before you can get saved. What it's saying is acknowledge your sinfulness. Realize you're sinning against God and you failed God's standard. Have a change of attitude towards the way you've been living. Acknowledge it and then turn to Christ in faith. That's what it means. It does not mean you have to stop every sin you're struggling with before Jesus can save you. That's not what it means. You understand what it means when they say repent and believe in Christ? It means have a change of attitude. Be convicted at heart about your sinful lifestyle, meaning before sleeping with women or men before marriage, no big deal. You didn't care, right? Abortion, you didn't think it's murder. Homosexuality, that's okay. In other words, the things that God calls sin, you were okay with, and you called them righteous. Now, however, because of the conviction of the Spirit, now you recognize Yes, what God calls sin is sin. I was wrong to view it otherwise. I was wrong to justify this lifestyle. I agree with God that the way I've been living has been wrong, and now I turn to Christ to forgive me. You get the point now? You understand what repentance means and doesn't mean when you have a John Piper or a James White or a John MacArthur or an R.C. Sproul calling people to repentance. They are not saying you have to turn away from every sin that you've been committing. Stop sinning before you can turn to Christ to be saved. You understand what I'm saying? What they're saying is have a change of attitude, a change of heart towards your sinful lifestyle. Recognize it for what it is, sin. Agree with God about your fallen condition and then turn to Christ for salvation. Is that making sense? I just want to explain because I see and I read and I hear a lot of misunderstanding. That's a different gospel. You can't turn from every sin and stop sinning 
before Jesus saves you. Well, <clears throat> that's not how I understood the call to repentance. And that's not what I mean when I call people to repent. What I'm saying is recognize and realize that your, your lifestyle is sinful. Have a change of attitude and a conviction of heart that the way you've been living has been <clears throat> sinful and you've been living in a way that's that's an act of rebellion, defiance to God. Recognize that. Admit it. Change your attitude towards the way you've been living and turn to Christ in faith. So you understand the, the, the meaning of that? Now, what we're not, what we're talking, Vine, you're talking about sanctification. We're talking about how's a person justified? How does a person attain a righteous standing before God? It's turning to Jesus Christ and trusting in him. Now that you've been given that righteous standing, Vine, does that mean you have a license to live lawlessly, sinfully? No. Now that you've turned to Christ and you are Christ's possession, you now have to live in a manner that pleases pleases God because now he's the Lord of every part of your life, right? So we're talking about two different things. We're talking about how does a person say justified? How does a person receive this righteous standing before God? They receive it as a gift by turning to Christ in faith. But now that you've turned to Christ, the Holy Spirit transforms you, does a work in you, to save you from the world, save you from your flesh, and transform you to live more like Christ, to be more like Christ, to conform to the image of Christ. That's what in Protestantism we call sanctification. Thank you, Dan Bitzel. You with me there? Yeah, well, when you say they feel snug, I don't know of any... Any person who's truly preaching the gospel that doesn't attempt to make people uncomfortable about being snug or complacent, <clears throat> if they are professing believers who claim to love Jesus, right? So I don't know. You know, we don't preach easy believism or cheap grace or hyper grace where we say it doesn't matter how you live, Jesus paid it all. No, no, no. That's not the teaching of the New Testament. That's not of Paul, the champion of justification by faith alone. Paul, in that same book of Romans, goes out of his way to exhort holiness, purity, righteousness, offering the members of your body as slaves to God and righteousness, and no longer offering the members of your body to your sinful passions. That's Romans chapter 6, the entire chapter. That's Galatians chapter 5. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 5. That's 1 Corinthians chapter... I mean, I can go on and on and on and on. Right? So I just want to make it clear. And let me show you where... Well, Vine, that's been a debate for centuries. And I'm not going to be the one to settle that debate. So, Vine, you're asking someone who is standing on the shoulders of theological giants that put me to shame, that I can't hold a candlestick to, who are not able to reconcile the tension in Scripture between someone born of the Spirit and kept by the Spirit and those passages that warn believers that if they don't walk in the Spirit, they can be cut off, whether those are prescriptive or descriptive. And maybe I will talk about that in the near future, but to be quite honest with you, Vine, I am not going to be the one to settle this debate. It is true, Vine, historically, and even today, the majority Christian position and the historical position has been that those born of the Spirit can choose to walk away and be cut off from Christ. You get my point, Vine? So that has been the historic position of the church. And it's still the predominant position today among professing Christians. It is the select group of Baptists and Calvinists that believe that if you've accepted Christ, then you are eternal secure. But among the Baptists, it's more akin to easy believism that if you say the sinner's prayer, it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to heaven. Whereas Calvinism teaches the perseverance of the saints in that if you're born of the Spirit, you will endure by the power of the Holy Spirit in holiness. Because God will preserve you holy till the end. So 
So that if you turn away, then you were never born of the Spirit. You never belonged to Christ. Just like Judas, people thought he belonged to Christ. But Jesus tells us from the beginning, he never belonged to him. He belonged to the devil, which is why he fell away. But those who did belong to Christ, Christ kept them from falling away. Right? You want me there? Ever understand that in the Calvinist understanding, if you're truly born of the Spirit and you belong to Christ, you will endure with the power that the Spirit gives you in obedience till the end because the Spirit will preserve you faithful to the end. So that if you turn away, never to return, then you never belong to Christ. You're like a Judas who made a profession of faith and from all external appearances looked like he was a believer. But Jesus told us from the beginning, he didn't belong to me. He belonged to the devil from the get-go, which is why he turned away and was destroyed. You get my point? Let's look at, let's look at those passages real quickly. Yeah, like I said, born again for Christ, I'm not going to solve this debate. Majority of Christians today, and historically, believe you can lose salvation. Then there are those who believe that if you're truly born of the Spirit, the Spirit will work in your heart that you don't want to turn away. And if you turn away for a season, the Spirit's going to make you ache for Christ and hunger for Christ and run back into his arms. Case in point, Andrew Martin. He's here. The man, though claims to be an atheist, he keeps coming back to Christians. He keeps wanting to hear about Jesus because he's in love with Jesus. He's right here. You hear me there? Now, Vine, let me show you what I mean. The passages that the Calvinists would use to prove that if you're born of the Spirit, you'll endure to the end. Because the Spirit will preserve you for the glory of Christ. So that if you turn away from Christ, never to return, you never belong to Christ from the get-go. Let me give you the examples of the passages they'll cite. Are you ready? Now, I'm just giving you that side. In the near future, if God is pleased to give me the health and the holiness and the protection from this corrupt legal system so I can be around to teach his word, I'll go into these issues. I'll go into these issues. But let me just give you... The case they would give you. Go to Matthew 7, 21 and 23. Right? Matthew 7, 21 and 23. So I'm not going to solve this debate. If you're looking to me to solve it, you're looking to the wrong guy. I am not God's gift to the church. And I'm not the greatest theologian, evangelist that has ever existed. Far from it. I'm a neophyte and an amateur. But here, Vine, case in point. Matthew 7, 21, 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now listen to this. Many will say to me on that day, on the last day, on the day of judgment, on the day of resurrection, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied a name? Did we not preach like I'm doing? Proclaiming the name of Christ. And in thy name have cast out devils. We even cast out demons like Chris LaSala boasts. Chris LaSala says, see, I cast out demons. That's how I know I belong to Jesus. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Now notice what Jesus says, Vine. Everyone else, pay attention. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Notice he doesn't say, yeah, I knew you. We had a relationship. And then you walked away. He says to them, I never knew you. You never belonged to me. We never had fellowship with one another. So these people never belong to Christ. Did you catch it, Vine? Because he says, I never knew you. New means intimate communion and fellowship, not, you know, mental recognition because obviously he knew these are false christians he knew by their lifestyle because he says you workers of iniquity the greek word iniquity is anomian or anomia without law this was the proof that they didn't truly belong to christ 
because they were lawless. They did not obey his commands and put them in practice, which goes back to the earlier point you're saying, Vine. If you truly trust in Christ, if you truly cling to Christ, if you truly hope in Christ, it's inevitable that you're going to then obey Christ as the necessary fruit of your salvation because Christ has now made you a good tree and the proof that you're a good tree, you're going to bear good fruit because you're planted in living waters, the Holy Spirit. You want me there? Vina, is it sinking in for everyone else? But these people thought they were Christians. And they even came boldly before Christ saying, did we not prophesy, do miracles, and call them Lord, Lord? And he said, so? You were workers of iniquity, meaning you were lawless. You had no regard for my commands. You didn't put my teachings into practice. And then he goes on to say that in 24 to 27. He compares two types of people. Those who hear his word and puts it in practice like a house built on rock. No matter what Satan brought or the world brought, that man stood. And then the other one who heard his word but didn't put in his practice was like a house built on sand. And the fall was great indeed. Angela and Orthodox, let's not get into a side debate about free will and how much freedom we have to choose and how bound is our will because of our sinful nature. Like I said, these are debates we're not going to solve. So just let's focus because I'm trying to answer a specific question by Vine. Let me repeat. Historically and even today, the majority position is you can lose your salvation. But then they, you have those like Baptists, specifically independent fundamental Baptists like Stephen Anderson who believe that if you turn to Christ and say the sinner's prayer, that's it, you're saved, even if you fall away. Then you have the Calvinists who say perseverance of the saints, that if you're truly born of the Spirit, united to Christ, the Spirit will energize you and give you the desire and the power to want to endure and remain faithful to Christ, even though you'll do it imperfectly, but you'll remain till the end. Clear? And so if someone falls away, they'll tell you, it's because he didn't belong to Christ. And here, let me give you an example. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. I don't know who you're talking to, Michelle. Got to be more than that. And no, nah, and I have no idea what you guys are talking about. See, now see, Orthodox represents historic position, majority position. And he's telling us you can lose salvation if you freely walk away from the Lord. So again, it's, it seems like what I'm saying is falling on deaf ears. There are two positions. There is the historic position, majority position, you can lose salvation. And there's a position that says you can't. So now you guys are now going to start debating each other. The camp that says you can't, the camp that says you can, and it's going to be a free-for-all. Folks, let me repeat. You will not solve this debate in this lifetime. You're going to debate this issue until Jesus returns. 1 John 2.19. 1 John 2.19. See? See, now notice Dan Betzel is speaking as a Calvinist. Even the faith is a gift of God and the spirit is a guarantee of our inheritance. You catch it? You see what happens, Vine? Everyone else? The Calvinists will chime in. The independent fundamental Baptists will chime in. And then the Orthodox will chime in. And then the Catholics will chime in. And the Coptics will chime in. And the Nestorians will chime in. And then the Arminians will chime in. And it's going to be a free-for-all. 1 John 2, 19. Let's read. They went out from us, those who turned away from the faith, never to return. Notice what John says. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Did you catch it now? But Coptics are also Miaphysites or Monophysites, whereas Orthodox are Diaphysites. Right, Orthodox? Why? Okay. 
First John 2 19, one more time. First John 2 19, one more time. See? Too many issues, too much. We're not going to solve it. Let me repeat again. If you believe you can lose salvation, all right, that's between you and the Lord. If you believe that God will preserve you and change your will, that you desire not to turn away from Christ, or if you do, he'll bring you back, that's between you. I'm not going to solve it. No one's going to solve I'm telling you, it's not going to be solved. 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us. This is a passage that Calvinists would use or those Baptists would use. To show that if someone turned away from the faith, never to walk with Christ again, because they never belonged to Christ. They went up from us, but they were not of us. So why did they leave? Because they didn't belong to us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. See, this is what they quote. Those who believe, those that are truly born of the Spirit will never turn away, but will preserve by the power of the Holy Spirit. They quote these passages. You get it? So they're telling you, yeah, a person can make a profession of faith. He can even live the Christian life for a season. But if he's not truly born of the Spirit, filled with love and faith from the Spirit, united to Christ, it's a matter of time and it's inevitable that person turns away or lives in such a manner to show that he's not a true Christian, per Matthew 7, 21, 23. Right? Clear? Let me give you an example in the lifetime of Jesus. John 6. Now, it's a long one, but for the rest of you, write down John 6. Skype show? What's the difference between Skype show and YouTube live? John 6. Write down John 6, 60 to 71, because I'm not going to read 60 to 63. John 6, 60 to 71, it says, a group of Jesus' disciples started grumbling because he said you must eat his flesh and drink his blood. We're going to catch it in midpoint, in midpoint, because John is going to explain why some so-called disciples grumbled. John 6, 64 to 71. John 6, 64 to 71. I don't know if Vine had to leave. Call it a night. That's fine. John 6, 64 to 71. Watch. Read with me. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Now, guys, I'm confused. These people that were with Jesus did believe. They were his disciples. They couldn't be his disciples if they didn't believe. So why is Jesus saying some of you don't believe? And notice what it says. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him by my father. True faith that cleaves to me, true faith that clings to me, true faith that remains in union with me is a work of my father. Now notice what happens when he says that. 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Okay, Orthodox, you see you're playing games and semantics. If the two natures became one nature, then that's one nature, not two. That's why it's called miaphysitism. Miaphysite. Mia, one, phusis, nature. Okay? But anyway, let's focus here. Let's focus. They turned away, 666, and walked no more with him. Now, notice 67 to 71. John 6, 67 to 71. 71. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Will you walk away too? Notice the response. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Now notice Jesus' response. Jesus answered, Have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is the devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of, si uh, son of Simon, for he it was that was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Did you catch it now? Did you catch it? Why did those so-called disciples who believed in Jesus walk away? Because they were never truly of Christ. They were never drawn by the Father. 
Why did Judas betray Jesus? Because Jesus says, one of you is the devil. You don't belong to me. You belong to the devil. So these are the passages that the Calvinists will appeal to to show only those who don't truly belong to Christ turn away, never to return. Because those who truly belong to Christ will be kept by the Spirit, drawn by the Spirit, and sealed by the Spirit. These are the passages they'll quote. And then you're going to have the other camp quote other passages to show that those who did walk in the Spirit, bore fruit from the Spirit, did signs and wonders, could fall away and be severed from Christ. You see the point? And then you're going to need time to explain which set of passages best explain the other set of passages. In other words, do I focus on these passages to interpret those that say that people fall away, though they've tasted the Spirit, done signs by the Spirit, right? Or do I interpret these passages that say those whom the Father has drawn to the Son and are kept by the Spirit, I interpret those passages in light of these that show that even them, of their own free will, can walk away because Christ will make sure that nothing external to them will pluck them out of Christ's hand, but Christ will honor their own free will to allow them freely to walk away. You see the point? Now notice Dan, Dan Betzel again assumes his position, and I'm not against him. He's assuming the Calvinist understanding of the covenant of redemption. And then because of that assumption, he's reading that back into these passages to explain how these passages work, which again makes the point I've been trying to make like a broken record. Dan, a five-point Calvinist, is going to interpret everything in the frames of his Calvinistic theology, including the covenant of redemption, where he believes that before creation, Father, Son, Holy Spirit entered into a covenant and voluntarily assumed the roles that they assumed to bring about the redemption of the elect, uniting them to Christ by the Spirit. You catch it? You see, you guys are doing exactly what I said you'd be doing. One group that believes that you can't lose salvation, you're going to keep speaking, explaining these other passages in light of what you believe. The other group that believes you can lose salvation will bring up other passages and explain these in light of that. So why do you guys keep doing what I said Christians do to prove this debate won't be solved on this side of eternity until Jesus returns. Right? So Orthodox, thank you for confirming I was right. Not all Orthodox Christians or branches of Orthodox believe in the two natures of Christ. And I wasn't condemning you guys for it. I'm just saying there are differences. Okay. Now that I've tried to answer Vine in brief, because this would entail weeks of intense, in-depth exegesis of the Bible, which in time I will do if God preserves me for his glory and wants to use me for his glory to bless you, knowing that I won't resolve the debate. You get my point? And it's not an issue of won't debate what the Bible says. The thing is, the Bible does have warning passages built. And then the Bible does have passages assuring those who belong to Christ that they'll never fall. The question is, how do we interpret these sets of passages? Because we know the Bible is the word of God, and the Bible does not contradict itself. It may have what we call apparent contradictions because we don't know everything, and we don't know the historical background of every passage in the Bible. So it may seem contradictory to us, but it makes perfect sense to God. Dan Betzel, you know what someone else will tell you? Because you're begging the question, they'll say, what glorifies Christ more is that he doesn't compel you to believe and remain, but honors your free will to remain or walk away. That's what makes Jesus beautiful. He doesn't compel people to stay who don't want to. You see the point, Dan? You're again begging the question. I don't know how much clearer I can make it. And I love you guys. I love Dan. I love every one of you. I do. But you understand, because I've heard both sides. I've heard both sides. And I've heard one side accuse the other 
of dishonoring God and not giving God the glory he deserves? They Both camps accuse the other of that. Both camps accuse each other of dishonoring God or robbing him of the glory that he deserves because of what they believe. So the Calvinist says this view is most God-honoring, God-glorifying, that Jesus saves the people and preserves them and saves them to the uttermost and works in them in such a way they never fall away. What an amazing, glorious Savior. But then the other side says God didn't make us robotons and, and, and just robots or puppets on a string. What makes God so beautiful is that he gave us free will because he wants us to exercise our free will to love him because he doesn't want to coerce us into loving him after all. If you force someone to love you, can they really love you if they they feel forced? And You see the point? And then it goes into rhetoric. And then it goes into emotion. And nothing gets solved. Now, let me let the cat out of the bag. Let me tell you what I believe. This is my belief. Are you ready? This is my belief. I believe if you're truly born of the Spirit, you'll be preserved by the Spirit, kept by the Spirit from ever falling away. Because even if you fall away, the Spirit will convict you in such a way that you're going to <clears throat> ache for Jesus, hurt for Jesus, Yearn for Jesus until you return. That's my conviction. So I believe if you're born of the Spirit, the Lord will preserve you. That's what I believe. Right. Now there are people who are going to disagree with me. That's fine. I am not going to solve the debate for you. One of the strongest passages for me is Romans 8, 26 to 39. Because in Romans 8, 26 to 39, Paul says, there's nothing in all creation that can ever sever you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in all creation. Well, last time I checked, I'm part of creation, and my desires are part of creation. So if nothing in all creation will sever me from Christ, that means not even I and my fallen desires can sever me from Christ because the love of Christ will compel me to want to return to him by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 26 to 39 does it for me personally. That's my conviction. If you disagree with me, that's okay. You don't have to condemn me and hate me. I recognize the other position and understand why they believe the way they believe. And it's within the pale of Orthodox Christianity. There are some things. That will bring you out of the fold of Christianity. That I can't recognize you as a brother and sister. This doesn't happen to be one of them. I don't know who's Heather. Someone Heather is saying? Someone's come up here. Is that clear for everyone? No, Dan, I'm not saying keep quiet, brother. No, 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 no. I am saying you can engage these topics and debate them passionately, realizing you're not going to solve the tension in Scripture, realizing you're not going to convince everyone, realizing that you're going to have to agree to disagree and not condemn the other perspective as heretical and outside the fold of Christianity. This is why I'm being very cautious in how I tread, because you have both camps accusing the others of not really truly being Christian. I've heard Arminians say the Calvinist God is like the Muslim God. He's an evil God. And I've heard Calvinists say that Calvinism is the gospel. And if you don't believe it, you're not saved. And I want to avoid that. You want me there? I want to avoid that. Okay. Debate these issues passionately, vigorously, boldly. But realize the one you're debating is not your enemy, is not an agent of Satan. He is or she is a child of God that you can de debate passionately and still view as a brother and sister that will be with you in glory forever. Okay, I hope that's clear. So let me go into the topic to continue where I left off. 
Let me first show you the passages that show that the Bible calls you to repent in order to be saved. So let me explain what that doesn't mean one more time. Lest someone accuse me of preaching a false gospel. I do not mean, nor do folks like James White, John MacArthur, John Piper, mean by repentance to salvation unto life that you have to stop all your sins, confess every single sin, stop all your sins before you can get saved. That's not what any of them mean. None of them mean that. Are you with me? Let me explain what they mean, I mean, by repentance leading to life. Repentance in this particular context means having a change of attitude, a change of heart towards the way you've been living, acknowledging, confessing, and admitting that you've been living in sin and your lifestyle is sinful and abomination to God, acknowledging that and then turning to Christ in faith. Clear? You understand what it means? Repentance and faith, right? It's not you confess every sin and stop every sin before you can get saved. That's not what any of them mean, right? What it means is a change of attitude, a change of heart, a conviction that God is right about your lifestyle. You've been living in sin. You've been steeped in sin, even though you thought nothing about your lifestyle and justified it. Hey, Sleeping with multiple women, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Getting women pregnant and then having them get abortions, nothing wrong with that. Homosexual, nothing wrong with it. Because the world says there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, metanoia, the Greek. But repentance means, no, that is sin. Abortion is murder. Premarital sex is sin. Cheating and lying is sin. I've been living in sin, and I was wrong to think otherwise. And I agree, and I confess I'm a sinner. Jesus, save me because I trust in you. You get it now? Does that interpretation make sense? That's what they all mean. Okay. Now let me show you where the Bible says repent. To be saved. Repent to be given everlasting life. Noting what I mean by repentance and what I don't mean. Because I don't, oh, Sam Shamu, Lord salvation, preaching that you gotta stop all your sins to be saved. No, that's not what I'm saying. I pray that for all of us, Dan. Empowered by the Spirit, sealed by the Spirit to be in love with Jesus Christ. Okay, let me show you that. Mark 1, 14 and 15. Mark 1, 14 and 15. Right? Mark 1, 14 and 15. Okay, let me show you that. Now we go into how were the Old Testament saints saved, justified? Now, after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. How are you going to escape the fact that part of the gospel proclamation includes an exhortation to repent? Jesus started his ministry by calling people to repent. You see it right there? Do you see it? Repent ye and believe the gospel. It's right there, man. So how are you going to accuse this of being a false gospel? Let's go to Acts 2, 37 to 38. Acts 2, 37 to 38. Acts 2, 37 38. By the way, even believing in Christ is an act of repentance because that means you have to turn away from unbelief to belief, right? And repentance means to turn, to change your course. So if I'm an unbeliever and then I become a believer, that means I turned away from my unbelief. I repented of my unbelief so I could believe. So you can't escape it. And I'll Acts 2, 37 to 38. 
Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Now, guess who convicted them and pricked their hearts? The Holy Spirit. Yes, exactly. Sola Fida, Philip Reinhardt. Make sure to listen to my session on it yesterday, okay? They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto him, Repent! Shame on you, Peter. How dare you say repent? What's wrong with you, man? Lordship salvation, Peter. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the mercy of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You caught it there? Acts 3, 19 to 23. Acts 3, 19 to 23. What's up, Payday? Make sure you pay me on my day. Acts 3, 19 to 23. Repent, ye th Peter again, Peter again. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. No, Peter, why are you preaching? Repent and be converted for their sins to be blotted out. What is wrong with you? Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, restoration of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. <clears throat> right? Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Peter, why did you say repent and convert for your sins to be blotted out the second time you said this? Because by repentance, Peter and Jesus did not mean you must stop and give up every single sin you've ever committed before you can turn to Christ. No, repentance means is be convicted, have a change of thought, change of heart, change of attitude towards the way you've been living. Realize you're a sinner in sin. Realize you need to turn to Jesus and believe in him to be forgiven. You get my point? Even believing in Christ is an act of repentance because it means you went from not believing to then repenting of your unbelief and turning to him in faith. Is it making sense? Come on, guys. 145, we got to hit that like button. Is it sinking in what it means and what it doesn't mean? Acts 20, 21. Acts 20, 21. When you say repent enough, repent towards who? If I repent and I follow Muhammad, that ain't going to do anything for me. Repentance in the Bible means turning to Christ, trusting in him for salvation. Acts 20, 21. Paul, look what Paul says. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith to our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, what are you doing? Come on, Paul. What repentance? Haven't you heard Stephen Anderson say that is a false gospel? That's faith and works, lordship, salvation. Right? I mean, what did Paul say? I preached to all Jews and Gentiles repentance towards God. Turn towards God and believe in Jesus Christ. Now let's see what our Lord Jesus said to Paul and what Paul says after he recounts his experience with the Lord. Acts 26, 18 and 20. Acts 26, 18 and 20. Exactly Revelation 20 through 13. Repentance simply means you are convicted at heart. You acknowledge your, your lifestyle as being sinful and abomination to God. You now regret it. You grieve over it. You have a change of attitude, a change of heart towards your lifestyle, and turn to Jesus in faith. That's all it means. It's not saying, that's it. I repent from every single sin. I'm not going to do any sin. Any. No one's teaching that. Come on, man. Are you serious? 
Acts 26, 18 and 20. Let's read. To open Jesus speaking to Paul and Paul recounting his conversion. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. Turn them. That's repentance. Repent means to turn. Turning from darkness to light and from the power of sin unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Did you see what Jesus said? Turning. Folks, don't take my word for it. The Greek, the Hebrew, and even the English. Repent means to turn. Jesus just used the word repent here. Turning them from darkness to light. How do you turn from darkness to light? By believing in Jesus. Ah, so he even includes repentance right here. Jesus himself. And how are they set apart? By faith in me. Turning from darkness and believing in Christ. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent. Wow, there goes that bad word again. There's, there's, they should repent. And turn to God, there goes those bad words again, and do, do works meet for repentance. Angela, that's irrelevant to the point of the Bible calling people to repentance. You're asking me a different question. Can a person repent apart from the grace of God's Spirit enabling him or her? I don't believe they can. You need the Holy Spirit to enable you. But that's still not directly related to the issue does the Bible call you to repentance and faith in Christ to be saved? Yes. Everyone got that now? Amen, Philip Rayner. And I pray he does that for all of us. Do you understand now what repentance means and doesn't mean? You understand what it means and doesn't mean? So when I get messages or I hear people saying, yeah, repentance is a false gospel, man. You're only saved by faith in Christ. Anyone says you that for do you understand what they mean by repentance? Folks, you understand even when you believe in Christ, that's an act of repentance. Do you understand what that means? For you to believe in Christ means you're repenting of your unbelief in him and turning to him in faith. Repentance means to turn. So even calling people to believe in Christ, what you're asking them to do is repent of your unbelief and turn towards him in belief. So even that entails repentance. You see, your call to an unbeliever believe in Christ includes the call to repentance because you're telling that person, repent of not believing in Christ, turn to Christ and believe in him. Right? Even the act of calling someone to believe in Christ, let it sink in, is an act of repentance because you are now repenting of your unbelief and turning to Jesus in belief. So how do you escape that? How do you escape it? An atheist doesn't believe Jesus is God. When an atheist is unbelieving, he's now believing, right? May the Lord bless the internet connection. Please, my God. Right? Did you catch it? An atheist who doesn't believe in God, when he then starts believing in God and Jesus Christ, that means he repented of his unbelief. You can't escape it. A Muslim who doesn't believe in the Trinity, when he believes in the Trinity and accepts Jesus as God, that means he repented of Islam, repented of his unbelief in the Trinity, and now believe. You can't escape it. How do you escape it? So enough of the nonsense saying... That whoever preaches repentance is preaching a false gospel. Because that means the person who's attacking this doesn't understand what the people advocating it mean by repentance. 
Because the word, the truth, they don't understand what you mean by repentance. Unless they're hyper, those who espouse hyper grace. Exactly, Philip Reinhardt. You got it. Okay, now if that's clear, if that's settled, if that's sunk in, I want to talk about how the Old Testament saints were saved. Exactly, Alex. But you have to explain to them what you don't mean by repentance. They're thinking you're saying you have to stop all your sins right there immediately, give up every sin and sin no more, then turn to Christ to be saved. I don't know of anyone in their right mind that means that when they call people to repent. You want to hear what? Oh, okay. But 16 and 11, so far I hope you're still blessed. Everything I covered I hope it was still beneficial and it blessed you and edified you, 16 and 11. Hope it did. Are we now ready? Okay. According to the New Testament, and I'm going to use the Old Testament to prove it. According to the New Testament, and I'm then going to use the Old Testament to prove the New Testament writers were right because they're inspired by the Spirit. All the Old Testament saints before the law, during the law, up until the coming of Christ, were never saved by the law. They're all saved by grace of God <clears throat> through the work of Jesus Christ and their belief in Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. Okay, let me repeat again. Let me repeat this again. The New Testament tells us, and the Old Testament confirms it, and I'm going to prove the New Testament is right. All of God's people in the Old Testament, every one of them, before the law, during the law, up until the time of Christ, they're all saved because of the Messiah who was to come, that Messiah being Jesus, and his work of salvation, which God made known to them, which they then trusted in and believed in and hoped for. They all were saved by grace of God, the grace of God revealed, manifested in the person and work of the Christ, who is Jesus, which they then hoped for, trusted in, and desired that they would be around to see the fulfillment of. Are you with me there? Did you get it? Now, King James 11. I hope up to this point you were still blessed and edified. Now we're going to go into the topic. Okay? Okay. Let's go to Romans 10, verses 9 to 10. Let's see what the gospel of salvation is. Yeah, Erwin mutes. Erwin, what I tell you now will be sufficient to destroy their objection. You got to go back, warrior of Christ, into my discussion of Hades, Gehenna, death, and Sheol. Because I cover that. Romans 10, verses 9 to 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Notice what Paul said. If you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, verbally confessing, making a confession publicly in front of witnesses, and believing in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved, right? Right? You'll be saved? Okay, so you got to confess Jesus is Lord. It can't be something in your heart. It's got to be verbal, so it's a public confession, making it known to others. I believe God raised Jesus. He's my Lord. Because your mouth will reveal what's in your heart. Your confession will testify to what's in your heart. Okay, so confessing Jesus is Lord and believing God raised from the dead is what saves you. Let's go to Mark 12, 35 to 37. Get ready, folks. Get in the saddle. KJ1611, uh, you haven't responded yet. Oh, because you're probably working and you're still listening. Anyway, Mark 12, 35 to 37. Mark 12, 35 to 37. Watch here. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? Pay attention. If you're not paying attention, you're not going to get this. For David himself, 
David, the patriarch who lived a thousand years before the historical Jesus walked this earth. David himself, said by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit moved David, revealed to David, inspired David to say, the Lord said to my Lord, sit down on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David, therefore himself, calleth him Lord. Whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Now, I don't know if it's sunk in. Did you see what Jesus just said? Jesus said, David, a thousand years earlier, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, confessed that the Christ was his Lord and wrote that his Lord, the Christ, sits at God's right hand. So wait, you're telling me David confessed with his mouth and wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Christ was his Lord, exalted to sit at God's right hand? He already knew that before it happened and believed in it and confessed it? Did it sink in? Let it sink in before I move on to the next point. Okay. What else did David know and confess? What else did David know and confess? Peter, on the day of Pentecost, filled with the Holy Spirit, right, quotes... David's Psalm, Psalm 16, 8 to 11. Now, pay attention to this. If you're not paying attention, you're not going to catch this. Let's see what Peter does with Psalm 16, 8 to 11. Let's go to Acts 2, 24 to 28. Acts chapter 2, 24 to 28. Watch here. And remember, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit to interpret this passage the way he does. Peter speaking, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Death could not have power over Jesus because he's sinless. For David, he now quotes David's psalm. For David speaketh concerning him. David spoke concerning Jesus. I foresaw the Lord. I saw in advance the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now, notice what David wrote a thousand years before the birth of Christ. Psalm 16, 8 to 11, David wrote, watch here, David wrote, that his soul would not be abandoned in Hades, nor his flesh see corruption. But here's the problem, folks. David died at the age of 70 and was buried. Peter is now going to say, we even have David's tomb with us. David has been dead for a thousand years, and his flesh did see corruption. It's deteri deteriorated. Deteriorated. So was David wrong? Was he a false prophet? Or did God lie to David, give him false hope that he would not have his flesh decompose? So did God lie to him or was David wrong? Here's Peter's answer. Acts 2, 29 to 32. Acts 2, 29 to 32. Here's Peter's answer. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried and his sepulcher, his grave is with, with us unto this day. So it can't be about David. And he's not a false prophet and God isn't a liar. So Peter, what's the solution? What's the answer? Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, a physical descendant of his would come, who would be the Christ. God would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, David, seeing this before, seeing it in advance, seeing it beforehand. He saw it, right? Spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. See, I don't know if it sunk in. Peter, David being a prophet, 
inspired by the Spirit, saw in advance, saw beforehand, Jesus Christ being raised immortal, yes. Jesus' flesh not decomposing, but being resurrected to immortality, yes. David saw it, yeah. Believed in it, yes. Wrote about it, yes. So David saw, confessed, believed, and testified. Jesus was his Lord, whom God raised up from the dead, yes. Oh, so David was saved the same way we're saved, by confessing Jesus is Lord and believing in his heart that God raised him from the dead. So let, let, get, I'm going to give you a moment for it to sink in. Did it sink in? We lost a few folks. We went from 140, 131. But now let's finish Peter's discussion. Acts, Acts 2, 33 to 35. Acts 2, 33 to 35. He then quotes the very psalm that Jesus quoted, Psalm 110, 110 verse 1. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, God exalted Jesus to his right hand in heaven. And having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, so the Father gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon his followers. Jesus has shed forth this Holy Spirit, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he, David, saith himself, The Lord Jehovah said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Wow. So Peter just said, David saw prophesied, wrote, spoke of, confessed, believed in the resurrection of Jesus the Messiah, his exaltation to heaven to sit at the Father's right hand and acknowledge Messiah as his Lord. So, folks, how was David justified and saved? Was he justified and saved by the keeping of the law? Or was he justified and saved by believing in, trusting in, hoping for, <clears throat> confessing that Jesus is the Messiah, his Lord, whom God raised from the dead and exalted to heaven? Okay, that's why David knew that he was saved because of the grace of the Messiah. And whomever God justified, God would never condemn ever again for any sins committed. He'd rebuke you, chasten you, and discipline you as a father does a son. But he would never cut you off and damn you to hell because you're forgiven for the sake of the Messiah. And David knew this. How do I know David knew this? Not only what Peter said, what Jesus said. Now... Let's see what Paul says about David. You ready? Romans 4, 6 to 8. Why would I need to help you out, Philip Reinhardt? Do you give up on the laws of Jesus now that you're saved? Do you ignore the 27 books of the New Testament where you're told how to live, how not to live because you're saved? So you leave them out? So then why would you ask me the question? Just because David is saved by grace, justified by grace through faith in Messiah, what has that got to do with him now keeping the law as an expression of his love and obedience to the God who saved him? Romans 4, 6 to 8. Pay attention. Romans 4, 6 to 8. Romans 4, verses 6 to 8. Don't get confused. Pay attention to what Paul does with David's psalm. Even as David also, David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, now he quotes David, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Did you catch what Paul did? He quotes David's Psalm 32, verses 1 to 2. Paul quotes Psalm 32, verses 1 to 2, a Psalm of David where David speaks of the blessedness of the man whom God does not condemn for his sins because God has now justified him. 
You understand what Paul did with Psalm 32, verses 1 to 2? A Psalm of David? Before I move on? In Romans 4, 6 to 8? See what he just did with it? Before I move on to the next point, if you're not getting these points, you're not, you won't understand what the Old Testament saints knew and how they were saved. Paul just quoted Psalm 32, verses 1 to 2, where David said, Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not count his sins against him, right? Whom God will never impute their sins against them and condemn them. Okay, so now you understand what Paul is saying. David knew that whomever God justified because of his grace, that person would never be condemned to hell, severed from the love of God, because of his sins, because God would never count his sins against him to condemn him to hell, because God had now forgiven that person his sins. Though God may rebuke and discipline him, he'd never cut him off and damn him to hell. Do you understand the point? And who knew this? David did. Let me show you the psalm that Paul was quoting. Psalm 32, verses 1 to 2. Psalm 32, verses 1 to 2. I'm going to have to do a part 2 of Old Testament saints. Psalm 32, verses 1 to 2. A psalm of David, Maschim, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom Jehovah imputeth not, will never count his iniquity, his sin against him, and whose spirit there is no guile. See, you see what Paul was quoting? Folks, can I ask you a question? If David wrote this, isn't this proof that David knew that the one whom God has saved because of God's grace, the one whom God has justified because of God's grace, that person, God will never count his sins against him, and condemn him to hell for his sins because his sins are completely forgiven. He is now justified. So God may discipline you and chasten you in this world if you're rebellious, but he'll never cut you off eternally. Ah, here's one of the passage, first and last, that folks like Calvinists and those Baptists and myself use to show if you're truly justified and born of the Spirit, You'll never be cut off and never lose salvation because God will preserve you. Folks, David wrote this. So David knew if you've been justified by God, saved by his grace, your sins are removed for e forever and ever, and you'll never be cut off from God and damned to hell. Yes, God will treat you as a son and discipline you and chasten you and rebuke you harshly, as he did with David when David committed adultery and murder. But God will never cut you off from his love forever and damn you to hell forever. Okay, now, here's where I'm going to get a little confused. Now you're going to learn why it is vitally important. Vitally important to know how to interpret the Bible and how not to interpret the Bible. Because here's where I'm going to get confused. Let's go to Psalm 51 and read the subheading. Psalm 51 and read the subheading. This psalm was also written by David, but when? When was it written? Watch here. Get ready to be blown away. How amazing the Bible is. How miraculously consistent it is. Psalm 51, verse 1, the subheading, Protestant. I don't know why you got excited and jumped to another verse. To the chief musician... A psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out, not, blot out my transgressions. Now notice, when did David write this? After God rebuked and chastened him through Nathan for committing adultery with Bathsheba and murdering the husband. So he wrote this after he was confronted, right? But then read Psalm 51, 10 to 13, because here's where you're going to get confused. Psalm 51, 10 to 13. 
Yeah, but Erwin, if there are people who believe you can lose your salvation, you may disagree with them, but don't condemn them as heretics. Psalm 51, 10 and 13. Notice what David says. Pay attention now. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, your face, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Don't take your spirit away from me because I'm a goner. If you take your spirit from me, I die spiritually and I will perish. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's twice you posted 11. 12 and 13 now, brother. God bless you. Thank you for serving us. 12 and 13. 12 and 13. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Now, David got confronted by Nathan, rebuked by Nathan, threatened by Nathan, that now, now God is going to discipline you, chasten you, and bring judgment on your household. And David, out of fear, repents and begs God, don't cast me from your presence. Don't take away your Holy Spirit. Forgive me, restore me, and create in me a new heart. Okay, but now, folks, I'm confused. David wrote in Psalm 32 that if God has justified you, he has removed all your sins, past, present, and future, and will never hold any of your sins against you to condemn you, to cut you away, sever you from his presence. So why is David afraid and begging God, don't remove me from your presence, don't take away your Holy Spirit from me, if David knows that the one who's justified will never be cut off from God. But now let me blow you away a little more. Let me blow you away a little more. Are you ready? You ready? This was written after Nathan confronted him. Do me a favor again, Protestant. Post the subscription. Subscription. The superscription. Psalm 51, 1, to see again when he wrote this. The heading. One more time. Watch here. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him, after he had gone into Bathsheba, have mercy upon me. Now watch. He wrote this after Nathan rebuked him. But now notice 2 Samuel 12, 13. Watch here. This is why you have to learn how to interpret scriptures in context and not isolate scriptures from what the Bible teaches as a whole. If you believe the Bible is consistent because the author is one, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit doesn't contradict. Notice 2 Samuel 12, 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against Jehovah. Right away, right away. Doesn't wait for David to write Psalm 51. And Nathan said unto David, Jehovah also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Bam. Even before David wrote Psalm 51, he's clearly told, your sin has been removed, you won't die because of it. Wow. Confirming the truth of Psalm 32. Let it sink in. Did it sink in? Let's post 2 Samuel 12, 13 one more time. One more time. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord Jehovah. And Nathan immediately, right away, doesn't wait for David to write a psalm confessing his sin. And Nathan said unto David, Jehovah has also put away thy sin. He's removed your sin already. Thou shall not die. Confirming Psalm 32 verses 1 to 2. So then why did he write Psalm 51? David was already told, you won't die. You won't be severed, cut off from God's presence. Your sin has been removed completely and permanently because you are that blessed man whom God has forgiven and will never count a sin against him. Why are you guys getting to side talks, ABC and everyone else? Pay attention. So then why did David write Psalm 51? Because here's the lesson you're supposed to learn. Are you ready why Psalm 51 is written? Psalm 51 wasn't written for David to repent in order to receive forgiveness. He was already forgiven. His sin was already removed. His sin wasn't counted against him already before he wrote Psalm 51. 
So why did he write it? Why did he write it? Because here is what the Holy Spirit wants to show you. Just because you're forgiven, just because God will not hold your sin against you, just because your sins will never be imputed to you and you'll never be severed from the love of God, doesn't mean you remain complacent and indifferent and nonchalant about your sin. Because if you truly love God, then you'll be broken over your sinfulness, hurt by your sin against God, and fall before him, begging for forgiveness, even though you're already forgiven and your sin has already been removed and won't be counted against you. God wants to see a contrite heart, not a heart full of arrogance, where you're indifferent and nonchalant about sinning against God. That's why Psalm 51 was written. You understand why it was written? It was not written for David to be restored, re-justified, re, re -saved, to be forgiven, because 2 Samuel 12, 13 already told you. When David said, I've sinned against Jehovah, Nathan immediately said, Jehovah has removed your sin, you'll not die. Confirming Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, that the man who's been justified by God, he is blessed, she is blessed, because God will never count your sin against you to condemn you to hell and sever you from his love. Right? So then David was already told, David, you won't die. Your sin is not counted against you. You'll be disciplined. You'll be chastened and punished severely as a father disciplines a wayward son. But rest assured, you won't be severed from God. You won't be damned eternally because God has already forgiven you of that sin and you are his forever and ever. So then why write that psalm, David? Why cry out to God, David? Why ask God not to take away his spirit from you, for his spirit from you, not to cast you from his presence when you're already told God won't do that? Because the Holy Spirit is trying to show you your attitude when you sin. Don't remain nonchalant, indifferent, and arrogant because you are justified and won't be severed from God. Rather, your heart should break when you sin against God. Fall before the feet of Jesus from a sincere heart that's broken from grieving his heart and ask him to forgive you, though you're already forgiven. Salvine, if you keep talking about issues not related to the topic, I'm going to block you. Respect me and stop. Yes, the reason why the Spirit left Saul, because Saul was severed and cut off from God, because God gave Saul what he deserved, and he wasn't that blessed man who was justified. He was like Judas, who fell away to be destroyed. DJ McAllister. You know, I know Saul was like a Judas who never belonged to God. And so God handed him over to his desires and gave him what he deserved. So he wasn't that blessed man who was justified, who would never be severed from God. You know how I know DJ McAllister? You want to know how I know? Anybody? How do I know Saul is not that blessed man because he wasn't justified. He wasn't truly born again. He wasn't truly of the Lord. And therefore God handed him over to the desires of his heart and gave him what he deserved. Because of 2 Samuel verses 14 and 15. Amen, Nada. Because of 2 Samuel... Chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. Pay attention. 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. I don't know why you're giving me 12, Protestant. Protestant, you've been dropping the ball for the past week. I'm really tempted to hurt you. And someone told me I shouldn't be talking like this, but I'm going to hurt you, brother, because, remember, I discipline people whom I love because I'm trying to imitate God. Just kidding. May God have mercy on all of us in Jesus' name. 2 Samuel 7, 14 and 15. 2 Samuel 7, verse 14 and 15. Yep. 
I will be his father. God's promising David to raise up Solomon, his son. Pay attention. I need you to pay attention. I will be his father. I'll be Solomon's father. He shall be my son. Son, if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. There's your answer. There's your answer. Did you catch it? I took away my mercy and love from Saul and gave him what he deserved and handed him over to the desires of his heart. But I won't do that for you, David, or for Solomon, because you are the blessed men who have been justified, whose sins will never be counted against them. You caught it? Everyone caught it? Now, let's look at Romans 3, 24, 26. I'm going to tie it in with 2 Samuel 7, 14 again. And then I'm going to have to do a part two tomorrow. 2 Samuel 7, 14, 15, after Romans 3, 24, 26. First Romans 3, 24, 26. Pay attention, everyone. Being justified freely by his grace, his unmerited favor. Grace is favor that you cannot earn. F favor freely bestowed. And this grace is yours through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Propitiation means Christ offered his life as a sacrifice to appease God's wrath, remove his anger towards sin, removing God's anger and hatred towards sin, appeasing him, right? And this propitiation appeasement is ours through faith in the blood of Jesus. Do you want God to be propitiated towards your sin? You want God to be appeased and no longer angry at your sin? Then trust in Jesus and plead his blood. That's what it says there. You see it? To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say unto this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now, I want you to reread the last part of 25, 26. Notice what it says. It says, God in his patience and forbearance overlook past sins. Whose past sins? The people he's speaking to, he's talking about their past sins. All the sins that you committed. God did not destroy you because of them, but waited patiently because he knew your sins would be atoned by the blood of Jesus, which you received by faith. And he's also talking about the sins of those that came before. Why didn't God destroy Solomon for having 700 wives, 300 concubines who enticed him to worship their gods and goddesses and sacrifice to them? Why did God overlook that? Why did God not kill David dead for committing adultery and murdering the husband to cover his sin when, according to the law of Moses, both of those crimes were punishable by death? Why did God not give these Old Testament saints what they deserve by destroying them and damning them to hell? Why did he overlook their sins? Because he knew their sins would be atoned by the blood of Jesus, which they believed in advance and hoped for. Do you understand what he's saying? You understand why? Solomon wasn't cut off and damned to hell, even though he deserved it. David wasn't cut off and damned to hell, even though he deserved it. Because the blood of Jesus would be shed to cover their sin, so God could be gracious to them, overlook their sin, and seal them and preserve them forever because Christ would be sent to die to atone for their sin. So God overlooked it knowing that those sins would be paid for. And then the next part says the reason why Christ came to die for our sins to demonstrate God is just and justifies sinners. What does he mean by that? Paul is saying if God basically overlooked all sins and didn't demand payment for sins and punishment for sins, then God would be compromising his righteousness, his justice and holiness. 
he'd be showing himself to be less holy, less just than he is loving and merciful. So Paul is saying, how can God be completely just, completely holy, and perfectly loving and merciful without compromising either set of attributes? Because if he simply forgives, then he's more loving than just and holy. But if he punishes for every infraction and doesn't forgive, he's more holy and just than loving and merciful and forgiving. So then how can he maintain integrity in all of his attributes? Through the cross of Jesus Christ. God can now forgive you and still demand that his justice be satisfied because in the person of Christ, he satisfied his justice, paid the debt of sin so that he maintains perfect justice and integrity and righteousness and now has a basis to forgive you. So he's perfectly consistent across the board. Only in Jesus do we find such a marvelous consistency in the attributes of our God. Only in Jesus and the cross of Calvary. Clear? Only the gospel of Christ. Only the gospel of Christ. maintains God's perfect integrity and perfect balance in all of his attributes so that he's not more loving than holy, more merciful than just, or more just than connection in Jesus' name. It's, it's freezing up buffering. Our God is infinitely, incredibly incredible. Right? Is that clear? What Paul is saying in Romans 3, 25, 26? Rebuke the attacks of the enemy in Jesus' name. Yeah, Allah. Okay, I'm just waiting for it. It's buffering bad. Yeah, Allah. Please, Lord. Right? When it's about to get exciting. Hope you're still hearing me. Clear, right? Clear, right? Made sense? You heard it? Only the cross of Jesus upholds God's perfect integrity and the perfection of all of his attributes. So he's not more loving than just, more merciful than holy, or more just than compassionate. He's perfect in all his attributes. Perfect in all his attributes. Perfect in his holiness, justice, mercy, love, and compassion. Only the cross of Jesus. Right? Clear? Okay, now, let's look at Romans 3.25 one more time and show you something amazing, and I'm going to call it a night, and we'll do part two of this topic, Salvation of Old Testament Saints, tomorrow, God willing. Okay. Read the last part of Romans 3.25. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. What he means here is, God overlooked the sins of the past and patiently overlooked them and didn't rush to destroy people for their sins because he knew the sins of those who believed in the past would be atoned for by the blood of Jesus, right? That's what Paul is saying here. You catching it? That's what he's saying here. Now let me show you something amazing. 2 Samuel chapter 7 is 14. Get ready to be blown away. This is why, you know, Paul was filled with wisdom, understanding from the spirit to see these things. Because notice 2 Samuel 7, 14, and let me blow your mind away. How amazing the Bible is, how amazing our God is. DJ McAllister, keep being confused because I'm not going to answer your question. That's going to take me off topic. Nice try, though. Be patient and stop focusing on something that's going to make you lose the point. 2 Samuel 7, 14. I will be his father, talking about Solomon. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, if Solomon sins, and he did, I will chasten him with the rod of men. I'll raise up men to beat him with rods and with the stripes of the children of men, and I'll have men whip him. That will be his punishment. Folks, all you need to do is read 1 Kings 11. God 
forgave Solomon and didn't punish him for the sake of David and didn't even take away part of the kingdom. He said to Solomon, I'll let you reign as king till you die for the sake of your father. I won't punish you. But God just said, when Solomon sins, I'll raise up men to beat him with rods and flog him. God didn't even do that. You know that? That's 1 Kings 11. God didn't even do that. Do you know why? Why do you think Jesus was beaten with the rods of men and flogged by men? Why was Jesus beaten with rods and flogged by men? Because he was taking the punishment of Solomon, which is why God could overlook it. God overlooked the punishment of the sons of David sitting on his throne because he said he punished them by the rods of men and the floggings of men, but he didn't do it to any of them because God didn't go back on his word. He punished them through their substitute, Jesus, which is why Jesus took the rods of men, the blows of men, and the stripes of men because he was taking their punishment. Making sense? Making sense? You read it. Rods of men and the stripes of the children. Many I'm gonna have men whip him and beat him with rods. God, but you never did it. You forgave him and overlooked the sin. And you forgave and overlooked the sins of all those of Israel that tried to walk righteously but fa failed, like Hezekiah. No, I didn't overlook it. Meaning, no, I didn't just simply. Let it go, because I, the second person of the Godhead, the eternal Son Word, became flesh and became a son of David to then bear the punishment of all the sons of David before me. I am the one who took the whipping of the sons of men and the beating of the rods of men because I stood in their place in order to atone for their sins, which is why I could then forgive them and never count their sins against them. So, Lord willing, part two, I'm going to go more in-depth on how the Old Testament saints were saved. They were saved the same way we were, but let me end it with this, and tomorrow I will show you the positive side. Solomon is a picture of Christ at his height, when Solomon was at his height, but he's also a picture of the Antichrist in his fall. Did you know that? Solomon, at his height, is a picture of Christ, and I'll unpack it tomorrow, God willing, not tonight. But he's also a picture of the Antichrist in his fall. Because if you go to Revelation 13, specifically 18, it says the number of the beast, the Antichrist, is 666. 666. Now, when you get a chance, read 1 Kings chapters 10 and 11. 1 Kings chapters 10 and 11. Solomon did everything God said the king must not do. Write down 1 Kings chapters 10 and 11 and Deuteronomy 17 verses 14 and 20. Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 to 20, God anticipates that when Israel enters the land, they're going to want a human king. Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 to 20. God then has rules for the king to observe. A king has to be an Israelite. He has to have a copy of the law so he doesn't get puffed up over his brethren. The law will remind him to be humble before God. A king cannot multiply wives lest his heart turns away. Deuteronomy 17, 17. He cannot multiply horses from Egypt. So he doesn't enter into a pact with the Egyptians because I want to take Egypt out of your hearts so you don't desire Egypt anymore. And he cannot multiply gold and silver. Everything the king is told not to do, Solomon did. Multiplied wives that turned his heart away from God, brought horses from Egypt, and multiplied gold and silver to such extent, pay attention, 1 Kings 10, read it, it says, that Solomon received annually, every year, he would receive 666 talents of gold. 666. 666 talents of gold. 666. That's 1 Kings 10. The number of the beast, the Antichrist. So Solomon at his height 
was a picture of Christ, but in his fall, he becomes a picture of the Antichrist, the beast. Right? Lord willing, more on Solomon tomorrow and how people are saved, were saved in the Old Testament. Folks, can you covenant, covenant with me that up until the 20th, that you pray and fast for a miracle, God's miraculous intervention, to save me from the wicked, filthy, satanic heart of the judge. Doesn't hold me in contempt of court because I can't be in court. My Lord has to go because I'm out of state and I'm not going back. To save me from this ridiculous satanic fine. fine, To provide through me and protect me and bring my children by breaking their mother to grovel before his feet. Because I miss them and ache them. I have not seen them or heard from them. And it's getting harder. So please covenant with me for these things. Lest shields me in contempt. And there's a warrant for no reason. I've done no crime, nothing illegal. And Sai Christian can testify how wicked and evil and demonic this woman is. Pray for God to show up for me, though I don't deserve it because of his grace. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Cover us in the blood of Jesus. Cover our loved ones. My daughter is in the blood of Jesus. Protect us and save us and seal us from the children of Satan, from the world, from our own flesh, and give us the power to walk in holiness and the health we need to glorify you until it's time for us to leave or until Christ comes down. We love you. We love you. We love you. Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care. Say, Christian, may God save you from her too. We both have the same wicked, evil, satanic judge. May God deal with her harshly for how she treated men. In Jesus' name, take care.